These days, we hear more about fitness and health than ever before, with the issue of weight control often being the main concern. However, studies unfortunately show that overweight is on the increase, and one problem is that many people don't have a proper notion of what real weight control is and what's the best and, in fact, the only healthy way to achieve it permanently. To most people, ideal body weight is how much you weigh on the scale, but this isn't really the best measure. The issue isn't so much what you weigh, but what percent of your weight is composed of fat. One pound of muscle tissue is active, denser, and smaller than one pound of inactive, less dense, larger fat tissue. So it's possible for two people who look about the same size to differ by 10 pounds on the scale, yet the one who weighs 10 pounds more could actually have less body fat, better muscle tone, and contours. I weigh 10 pounds more than I did when I was 20, but I look slimmer and my proportions are better, so the good news is that I've lost fat and gained muscle. I now burn more calories, even at rest, since my metabolism is higher and I can eat more food without putting on weight. And you'll understand why in a minute. So what we're really saying here is that weight control is really fat control. Achieving ideal percent body fat isn't just for appearance either, since excess body fat increases the risk of a number of health problems. Now, for a woman, a healthy percent body fat goal is between 18 to 25 percent fat. For a man, it's 10 to 16 percent fat. How do we reach and maintain ideal percent body fat? Well, many have tried the crash diet approach of losing weight. Low-calorie diets, generally less than 1,000 calories a day, for example, often lead to initial weight loss, but research shows that in the long run, this is one of the least effective ways to achieve ideal weight. You must eat enough calories every day in order to effectively burn excess stored fat, and here's why. When well-nourished, your body burns hundreds of calories every day in processes such as the beating of your heart, digesting food, brain function, and even breathing. However, if you don't eat enough food each day, your body will respond offensively. Scientists have suggested that within each of us is a unique set point mechanism that regulates the amount of fat we carry. It's believed to be a kind of survival mechanism of our species, a way of stocking up for times of famine and emergency. And if the body perceives that it's starving, as it rightly does if we're always on a diet or if we suddenly crash diet. The set point is thought to kick into action, causing the body to keep a tenacious grip on its fat supply. In order to replenish itself, the body will first cause you to crave high-calorie food. If you successfully resist these cravings, the body's next line of defense will be to slow down the metabolism in order to conserve calories. In the face of food deprivation, the body holds on to its fat stores for dear life. And in addition, because you're not getting enough calories, your body will use some of its muscle tissue for energy. And since muscle is an active tissue, which burns a lot of calories even at rest, losing muscle further lowers your metabolism. This slowed metabolism helps explain why you can lose weight initially but soon reach a plateau, and we've all experienced that. Now, since it's extremely difficult to maintain a crash diet for very long, when you eventually return to your normal calorie intake, the weight that's regained comes back mostly as fat, not as muscle. The more often you use a low-calorie crash diet, the more fat you gain. For example, Let's suppose that when you first started dieting, you weighed 150 pounds and were, say, 25% body fat. After losing 20 pounds on a low-calorie diet, but gaining it back within six months, you've again weighed 150 pounds, but since you've lost some muscle on this low-calorie diet, you've regained it as fat, you're now 28% body fat. Okay, so you try another low-calorie diet, and you've lost 20 pounds but regained it again your percent body fat increased to 32%. And after losing the same 20 pounds on the third low-calorie diet and regaining it, although you still weigh 150 pounds, you're now 36% body fat. 
So you see, it's true. Low-calorie dieting actually increases your percent body fat, lowers your metabolism, making it more difficult to burn fat and easier to store fat. So what's the answer? Effective weight control is more likely to occur when you combine adequate aerobic exercise with eating enough of the right kinds of food. And it's nice to know that these habits also reduce your risk of heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis, and many other health problems. Now, I said earlier on that only through aerobic exercise can you increase your body's ability to burn fat. When you exercise, your body gets its needed energy from carbohydrate as well as fat. If fat loss is a goal of yours, it's important to exercise in a way that maximizes the burning of stored fat. Because of the fact that aerobic exercises use more fat and less carbohydrate for fuel, they tend to decrease appetite. And this is especially true if you exercise an hour or so before a meal. The pace at which you can exercise aerobically depends a great deal on your level of fitness. For example, if you have a high level of fitness, you can likely walk a mile in 12 to 15 minutes and be aerobic the entire time. But if you're moderately fit, You'll only stay aerobic if you slow down and walk the mile in about 20 minutes. If you try to walk it in 15 minutes, you'll become anaerobic, tire quickly, and burn only a small amount of fat in the process. If you're just beginning and you're out of shape, that aerobic mile could take 25 minutes or longer. Here's another thing. As your aerobic fitness increases through regular, vigorous, but not overly intense exercise, your body activates more of the special enzymes that break down stored fat. This fat is then delivered to the active muscle tissue where it's burned. Aerobic exercise is the only safe and effective way to mobilize excess stored fat from all over the body, both under the skin and marble deep inside the muscles. Dieting alone cannot do this. Now, there are many types of aerobic activities. Most movements which make you bend and straighten your knees and hips rhythmically and continuously are great for aerobic exercise. Aerobic dance, walking, jogging, cycling, swimming, cross-country skiing, climbing stairs. These are all examples of activities which use the large muscles of the thighs and hips. And it's the rhythmic squeezing of these large muscles which cause the heart to pump a lot of blood and oxygen to the muscles. As long as the cardiovascular system can deliver enough oxygen to the muscles, both fat and carbohydrate will be used for energy. So the aerobic benefits like fat burning are fantastic. The best activities for you are the ones that you enjoy the most and are convenient. It's as simple as that. Pay attention to your breathing. Since you'll begin to gasp for breath when your muscles become anaerobic, use the breath test to stay aerobic. If you become breathless during exercise, you're no longer in your maximum fat burning or aerobic zone. Exercise at a challenging pace, comfortable enough to complete a sentence without labored breathing. Most experts recommend 30 to 60 minutes of exercise each session to maximize the fat burning effect. Of course, you'll burn some fat if you exercise aerobically for 15 minutes, but not as much as you would if you exercised for longer sessions. Just remember that no matter how long you go, properly paced aerobic exercise shouldn't be exhausting. It's also important to exercise at least three days a week. Four to six days a week, if you can, is even better. A brisk daily walk can be just about as good as an aerobic exercise of cycling or running, and always be sure to warm up and cool down for at least three minutes before and after your aerobic exercise, and finish with some basic stretches, as we always do in my video classes. Now let's turn to the principles of a nutritious diet. Good dietary guidelines for lifetime fat control are often more oriented towards changing what you eat rather than on cutting back on calories. In many cases, it's certainly important to reduce daily caloric intake, but in most instances, more attention should be focused on changing the types of food eaten, not just the quantity. For example, if we consider the four basic food groups, dairy, meats, fruits, vegetables, and grains, research shows that most of us get too many of our calories from the dairy and meat groups. While many people think that these food groups are high in protein, in reality, 
Most of the foods in these groups are very high in fat, not protein.